This is the sixth lesson of the Next Generation Security Management Training. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the Security Management API. In this lesson, we're going to cover the following. So basically, what is an API? We're going to talk about the anonymity of Next Generation Security Management API, talk about how to find information and how to work with this API, and whoops, what should we do if something goes wrong? And then we summarize everything again with some hands-on lab. What is this API thing that we hear so much about? Well, basically, an API is a means by which to interact with a computer system or software. Are APIs new to Checkpoint? No. We have our, for example, legacy OPSEC API, and if you want to have more information about that, you can read more about it on SK63026 on our support site. Now, what is new with the security management API? Well, the new thing is that it's a RESTful API. It stands for Representational State Transfer. Okay, RESTful API, what's that? Well, web services APIs that adhere to the REST architecture constraints, they are called RESTful APIs. So this is basically a mechanism that allows for systems to access, manipulate, delete, change, and add resources on application, now HP-based RESTful APIs are defined with the following aspect. So it's using one of the standard HP methods. You might be familiar with HP where we have HP methods. So we're having our methods like HP GET when trying to retrieve information from a website. So we're using those standard methods in RESTful APIs. It could be either a method of options, it could be HP method GET, HP method PUT, HP method POST, Etc. It could be any of the standard HP methods. So that's one part of, of RESTful API. The other part is that RESTful API is always called through a base URL. For example, for our security management solution, the base URL is the management IP address slash web underscore API. So that's the base URL where we're calling this RESTful API. We have an internet content type defined in our request that tells the client how to compose the request in the body that is sending to the server so the server can understand what actually is written inside the request. In Next Generation Security Management Solution, the Security Management API in the Checkpoint implementation relies on only the POST method. It's extremely easy to use. You only need to remember that you should do a HTTP post when sending RESTful API calls to our management server. So if I want to change an IP address on a server, it's still the POST method. I do a HTTP POST to the base URL, and then I add the API call, for example, set-host. If I want to add a host, I send the HTTP POST to our API server, and inside the base URL, I add the API call for example, add-host. What type of API does the management API server use? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, our API management server uses the HTTP-based RESTful API. All the API calls are sent using the HTTP POST method. Now, the content type defined for our API server and the one we're using is JSON-style format for the HTTP body. So this is an example of how a request could look like when sending an HP call to our management API server. So I'm sending an HP post towards the base URL, so IP address to management server, web underscore API, and then I'm sending my API call. In this case, I'm doing a login. And then inside the header, I'm defining the content type of how I formatted my body with my requested data. So in this case, I'm using the content type application slash JSON because I'm formatting the data in JSON format. And inside the body, I'm adding my request or my information in JSON format. So here I have an object with my user and username and password and password and domain I want to log into. <clears throat> so we're going to talk a bit more about that. Later. So what is JSON? So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So JSON is basically a text 
contextual representation defined by small sets of governing rules in which data is structured. So this basically makes it easy for humans to read and write, and it's extremely easy for machines to parse and also generate. JSON specification states that data needs to be structured in either of the two folding compositions. Either I can have a collection of name and value pairs, so that collection is known as an object, or I can have an ordered list of values known as an array, where the name is basically just a string with a defined name, and the value must be of the type, either the value needs to be a string, so string of characters, or a specific number, or uh, the value needs to be another object, or it can be an array, so it's a list of values, or it can be uh, of null, or it can be of a Boolean value, so that would be true or false, could be used inside the value syntax. An object in JSON is represented as a pair of curly brackets. It's surrounding zero or more name slash value pairs. In an object, a single colon follow each name separating the name from the value. The name slash value pairs are separated by commas if I would like to have multiple name and value pairs inside an object. White spaces can be inserted when formatting and structuring the text between any pairs of tokens. An object can look like the following. I can have object containing zero name value pairs, or I can have an object containing one value name pair. For example, this is the argument name, and this is the argument value. And I can have multiple value name pairs separated by a comma. So this is the argument name user and this is the argument value, Jim, separated by a comma, and then I have an argument name, password, uh, argument value, my password. I'm separating names with values using a colon, and I'm like, closing it in curly bracket, and that creates an object inside JSON. In JSON, an array is represented as a pair of square brackets surrounding zero more values. The order of values are significant, creating basically an ordered list of values inside this array. The values inside the array is separated by commas, and white spaces, once again, can be inserted between any pair of tokens in here. I can have an empty array if I want to, and I can have an array with multiple values or only one value. First value, separated by comma, second value, separated by comma, third value, separated by comma. Arrays can be used as values in objects, so I can create my object with curly brackets. I set the name and value pair, so this is the name for my argument, separated with colon, and then I say that it's some pointing towards an array of multiple values. In this case, this object refers to three values inside this array, and then I'm closing this object with a curly bracket. Because objects and also arrays can nest inside JSON, trees and other complex data structures can be represented when building JSON outputs. In this case, I'm sending HTTP post towards a base URL with the API command add minus host. In my header, I have my content type application with JSON. I can explain further later what SID ID is referring to, but let's leave it like this for now. Inside my body, my body is formatted into JSON format. I have my object, and this object is nested with additional object inside my object. So I have a nested object called NAT settings. Here I have my syntax name, and I have my syntax value. So I'm creating host1, I'm giving it an IP address, I'm assigning multiple tabs with an array of tag values, and then I have a nested object called NAT settings, and inside that object I have multiple name value pairs. And then I'm closing these nested objects, and I'm closing my host object that I'm sending towards my API server. Let's look at the anatomy of security management API. 
Basically, this is the architecture. We're using a RESTful-based API where I can communicate directly using web services. I also have a portable executable where I can communicate directly from Smart Console. No matter which of these ways I am communicating, all of them are sending the API commands in a REST full format to the multi-portal on the management server. Then the multi-portal will direct these API calls to the API web server based on the base URL and then the calls are going to be converted and sent down to CPM and then further down to the Postgres SQL database. In order to change the API server settings, we can either do that using the CLI inside the expert mode by issuing the following command, mgmt underscore CLI, and then set API settings automatic start to true, which means that the API server will automatically start once the checkpoint process is started with, for example, a CP start command. Or we can do it from the graphical user interface. This is the most common method. By clicking on manage and settings inside smart console, blades, and then management API, advanced settings, and then check automatic start box click OK and press Publish. Please remember that this will not turn on the API server if it's not already running. It will only take care of what's happening during the next CP start. This is showing us how we can do it inside Smart Console. So I click on Manage and Settings on a security management server. I click on Blade. I click on Advanced Settings under Management API. I ensure that I selected Automatic Start. And by default, the Management API will only listen to the local management server. So if I want to be able to remotely send API calls, I either need to select to listen to IP source IP address from machines defined as SKU clients, or I need to listen from all source addresses. Then I'll press OK. If I'll do it on a multi-domain server, I'll click on multi-domain, I'll click on blade, I click on advanced settings for management API, and I ensure that it's enabled for automatic start, and I'm ensuring that it's listening to, from the correct source IP address, so I can send remote API calls. Please remember that after the first reboot, after installation, the API server will be on by default for management servers with 4 gigabits of RAM memory or more. And in our 80.10 gateways, if we do a standalone installation, which means that we both have a gateway and a management server running on the same machine, I at least need to have 8 gigabits of RAM or more if the API server should be enabled by default after installation. If you have lesser memory, you can of course go into the smart console and enable the API server manually. To check if the API server is running, you can in expert mode run the following command, API space status. If it's not running, I can start the API server with the following command, API space start. If I for some reason need to stop the server, I can run the command API stop. If I do a change, so let's say I'm switching the configuration from listening to the management server IP only to listen to all IP addresses and then press publish, I need to reread the configuration into the management server. And to do that, I need to run the following command after publish, API space recon. Well, as mentioned earlier, there are three ways to interact with the API server. You can use web services, so basically just directly to the RESTful API server, send HTTP POST commands in JSON format. For example, I can send a add host command to the base URL as a post with my name of the host and the IP address of the host formatted in JSON format. So this is a JSON object to name value pairs. Or I can use the portable executable called management CLI, useful for shell scripting, for example. Or I can directly from Smart Console access API commands from a command line inside Smart Console to allow me to do fast operations, for example, add multiple hosts and so on. And I can do that directly from CLI command. Now, all of these three communication ways are communicating to the API server using the RESTful API calls. If I'm, for example, using a shell script and, and using the management CLI executable, entering the following command, the executable will convert this into RESTful API calls and send that to the base URL, to the add host API call, 
And then inside the HP post method, it's going to use content type application JSON, and the payload is going to be formatted in JSON format and sent to the API server. All of these three methods are using RESTful API calls to communicate with the API server. Where is the management underscore CLI portable executable? It exists both for Windows and Linux machines. So on the Windows machine, it's inside the Smart Console program directory. So you can copy this executable called mgmt underscore CLI dot exe. And you can copy that to any Windows machines you would like. And then you can run shell scripts from those machines remotely to your R8 management server. And from Linux machines, you can copy the file from $cpdr slash bin, and it's called mgmt underscore cli. And you can copy that to any Linux machine you want to. So it's a portable executable. It's self-contained, so you can use it wherever you want to. It communicates over HTTPS, so the communication is encrypted, sending RESTful API commands. The permissions and access are relying on the same authentication methods and permission profiles as I do when I'm using a normal graphical user interface client. And as mentioned, it's using HTTP slash S port 443. So this is where I can find the CLI from the graphical user interface console. Lower left corner, I have my command line. If I click on that, a black box will be open and I can write the command, for example, add host name, my host name, and then IP address. How do I find information and how do I work with API? If the API server is running, the most up-to-date reference documentation applicable to the installation version is available on the management server itself. So if I go to HPS and then IP address of my management server slash API underscore doc slash, I will get to the security management API reference guide that is applicable for the version I have on my management server. This is an example on how the reference guides are looking. So these are free text searches. So I can search for add host in here, and that will give me an example on how to add a host using web services call or the management underscore CLI executable. This is the URL, or easier, just uh, use Mr. Google and search for R80 API, and you will get to the online API reference guide. How do I work with a management underscore CLI portable executable? These portable executables are built around a set of commands, and then you include your argument names with those commands, and then you can add additional switches. So I can, for example, do the command add host, and then I can define, for example, name and IP address, and then I can add my switches if I want to send this to a specific, for example, management server. When working with the API, please remember this following operational flow. It works in the same way as it works when I'm working with the graphical user interface. First, I'm logging in and I'm getting a session. So I'm working with sessions when using the API in the same way as working with the graphical user interface. So I'm getting my session ID, and then I perform my changes using the API, using the session ID as a proof. And then once I'm happy, I can decide to accept my changes by publishing or discard my changes, or I can just basically directly log out, which means that those changes are still gonna be in my private session and the objects I am changing are still locked within that session, and that's also going to be seen from the graphical user interface. Now, the normal way would be to log in, get the session ID, do multiple different changes, be happy with them, publish, and then I don't want to do more and I can log out. This is the basic operational flow. Here's an example on how to work with the API. As I mentioned, you start with a login dialog and everything that you do is later associated with your session. When I do, for example, a management underscore CLI login with a user random task and password, for example, coffee, I will get a session with a session ID. So I can send this session ID to a text file called id.txt. I can then later use this text file in my API commands to call the session ID, to reuse the session ID as a proof. So this is a simple example on how to log in and create a new host. So first of all, we have the components my command. So I do a management CLI login user, 
and login a user is the command. I can do management CLI add host, that's the next command. Management CLI publish, that's the third command, the management CLI log out. Now, in addition to the commands, I'll add my arguments. So my argument name and my argument syntax. So with the management CLI login, I use my argument name user with my argument syntax to use a name. And please remember that arguments always comes in pairs, so have name and value pairs, similar to what we have in the JSON format, because these Eli calls is later formatted into HTTP REST-based calls towards the API server. The structure is exactly the same. So arguments has always come in name and value pairs. My password followed by the value of my password. For example, when I'm adding host, the name followed by the value of what I want to create the name with. So I want to create my host with name minion, and then I want to have the IP address, the value of the IP address, 1.1.1.1. One .1 .1 .1. So it's always in pairs, name and value pair. And then in the end, I have my management switches. As I mentioned earlier, we're always working with sessions. So I'm sending my session ID information to the id.txt file. And then I'm calling this file in my management underscore CLI script saying that I want to do these changes in the session I just log into. So using that with the dash S switch and then pointing towards the id.txt file that contains the information of my session ID. If I want to, I can also pass the session ID parameter explicitly. So same example, I'm creating a host. So I'm logging in as user random task password coffee, but in this example, I'm not sending the output to a file. Instead, I'm getting it on the screen. So here I have my session ID. I'll copy my session ID. I send my management CLI add host with my names and value pairs. And then I'm pointing towards the switch dash dash session minus ID or my dash ID. And then I include the session ID I got during the login commands. I explicitly send the session ID parameters in my script. There are two different ways to reuse the session ID as proof when sending the API calls. When not using the defined session, so I'm not logging in first and then pointing towards my session ID, but I'm instead directly sending the API command, for example, using the CLI management underscore CLI add host, then the CLI will ask me for username and password, and then the login and publish will happen implicitly. So if I just quickly want to, for example, add a host. So I'll send my commands, add host, again, my argument, name and value always comes in pairs. And basically what happens is that the server will ask me for my username and password, and then I'm, once done, it will create the host object and publish the changes. I can, of course, explicitly, if I want to, pass the username with the minus or that u switch dash p coffee for my password switch. One more important thing to note is that unlike dbedit, the management underscore CLI executable does not prompt for management IP address. It defaults to 127.0.0.1. To direct it to a remote IP, so if you want to send remote API calls using the management underscore CLI executable, you either need to use the management switch when sending the API call, or you need to set the environment variable on the machine that you're running the command from. So in this case, we're on a Windows client, remotely connecting to our management server, Hollywood-SM01. So I do a management CLI login, and I'm passing explicitly my username and password, but I'm not specifying a management server. Then it's going to try to connect locally to the local host. And as you see, the management server is not running local host, so I get a connection error. So instead, if I do the same thing, but I'm passing the switch dash M to Hollywood SM01, it's going to try to connect remotely to this host name. And I'm receiving my session ID, and then I can continue and do my changes using the session ID as proof. All the communications are done encrypted over HTTPS. So here's, again, the same example as we had before, but now we're trying to do it remotely. 
So we're logging in using graphical user interface machine where we're having Smart Console installed and we create a new host on our remotely management server. So we're using the management underscore CLI.exe since this is a Windows machine. We're logging in with the command login using user random task past coffee and then we're pointing towards our management server. And we're sending the output of the session ID information to the ID.txt. And then we do an add host. And as you see, we're pointing to the remote management server and we're reusing the session ID with the dash S flag. So once again, we need to send our arguments with uh, name and value pairs. It's always coming in pairs. Then we have our switches. So we have our switches with our management server and pointing towards the file containing the session ID. There's more. There's a way of working in batch mode as well. So wouldn't it be nice to be able to create, for example, host objects from a spreadsheet. This is actually possible. I can take a spreadsheet and I can convert that to a comma separated file and then I can use my management CLI commands in batch mode. So in this case I do management underscore CLI and then I have the command add host and then to get the syntax or arguments um, instead of typing the arguments like name host one, IP address one, dot one, dot one, dot one, um, instead pointing with the batch switch to a file containing my arguments or syntax with name and value pairs. How is this structured then? How does it work? Well, basically we place the argument names at the first row of the CSV file, and then we place the argument values as rows below that. So in the header, we have our names, and then following, we have our values. So we have name, minion1, minion2, minion3, IP address, 111, 112, 113, and then we have our comments. So what's basically going to happen when I'm executing in batch mode is that we're going to log in in our session, and then we're going to execute the add host command and use these values as arguments inside my command. So I'm send the first command with add host meaning one 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 comment first. Then we're gonna run add host again in batch mode automatically, reading the second line. We're just gonna use minion two, iPad S one 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 two, comment second, and so on. Now the nice thing for bulk operations is that it's possible to do for all management CLI commands. So you can use CSV files instead of arguments. So you can basically build rule bases and you can import objects and groups and services and so on from CSV files into your management server. Now, what about multi-domain environment? As mentioned earlier, you enable the API by going to MDS level, click on multi-domain, blades, advanced settings, ensure that it's started, and then define where we want to listen to API calls from. When working with domain, the API server is running on the MDF IP address. It's controlled by a domain key. When I'm logging in, I am specifying which domain I want to do the changes to. So I log in as I did before, for example, use a random task pass to coffee, but then in addition, I define the domain, for example, domain and then Hollywood. And then I'm going to connect to the domain Hollywood inside the MDS and do changes in there. So I'm always communicating to the MDS IP address, not the domain server IP address. Here's one example of creating domains. So in this case, we first of all want to log in to MDS level. So we log in as user Dr. Evil, our command, and then our arguments using name and value pairs with password. So doing it on MDS level, we don't define a domain. We point the session information to id.txt. Then we create our domains inside MDS. So the command is add domain. We give it a name and then we give it a server uh, IP address for the domain management server and then a server name for the domain management server name. As you see, we have a dot here. This means that we have nested objects. 
So in order to point to nested objects inside JSON using the management CLI, we're using the dot. The IP address and then the IP address value is a nested object of the server name value pair that we have inside the management server. In this case, we're basically adding three different domains and then we do a publish and then we do a logout. Once I've done a domain, I want to work with the domain and I would like to, for example, add a host into the Verticon Industries domain that I created in the previous example. To do that, I do a management underscore CLI login user, for example, Dr. Ever password VPN 123, and then I can use my dash M flag in order to point towards the MDS IP address, I also define the domain I want to do the change since, my value Verticon Industries. And I point that towards an id.txt file for my session identifier output. Then I just, as usual, do my management CLI add host name. Then I create a new host with this name, with this IP address, and I'm pointing towards the id.txt file. As you see, the command is exactly the same, even though I'm working in a multi-domain environment or a security management server. The only difference when building the script, for example, is the login command, where I need to point the login command towards a certain domain I wanna do the changes inside then that information is included in my session. So since I'm calling this session as a proof, the management server knows that the change is done. It's going to happen inside this domain. What about something similar to dbedit in the API, where I could basically do changes on any fields inside the database? We have something called General Objects API. So this is an extension of the regular security management API. Generic object API calls provide a way to perform operations on basically any object which is not covered by a specific API call. So the generic object API calls provide direct access to different objects and fields inside the database. As a result, when object and schema changes, script that relies on specific schema fields inside the database may actually break. So therefore, if you have an option, always prefer to use the documented APIs and not the generic object API calls. As the documented APIs are explained in the reference guide, they are future compatible because they're not relying on the database schema and they are QA tested and they have owners so we can get full support if we get problems with that specific API call through Technical Assistance Center. The reason I'm bringing up that they have this generic object API is because there could be certain situations where we need to do a change inside the database where we don't have a specific API call. If that happens, don't hesitate to contact me and I'll assist you and show you how to change that field inside the database using the generic object API. Okay, great. So we talked about how the API is structured, is using JSON format, and we mostly covered the CLI-based commands using the management underscore CLI executable that basically converts them into RESTful commands towards the API server. So please show me the web API instead. This is a sample on how the communication looks like from the client towards the server. So first of all, we start with a login. So we send the login command to the base URL web underscore API slash login. So that's the API call we want to do. We're using the header content type application JSON because the payload should be formatted in JSON. So the server will understand the format we're using when communicating to it. So in this case, we have our object with name and value pairs. As you see, it starts with a curly bracket. You have a real First name, user, it's always a string, separated with a colon, and then we have our user name. Name and value pairs can be multiple inside an object, so I'm separating that with a comma. And then we have our next name value pair, we have password, has a string separated with a colon, and then I'm sending my password inside this post. It's always HP post. I get a response from the server, as you see, I get my session ID formatted in JSON format again. So I have my 
a name value pair separated with colons and this is a JSON object and then here we can see nested objects included in this response as well. The next step is to do an add host in this example. I'm sending an HTTP post towards the base URL web underscore API slash add host so that's the API call. I'm still using in the header my content type application JSON. I adding an additional header when using the web services API called x dash checkpoint dash sid colon and then the session ID. So this is the session ID that I got from my login command using it as a proof to tell the API server that this is the session that I logged into and this is where I want to do my changes. Inside the payload for the add host command I'm sending the host name and the host IP address that I want to create. Formatted in JSON format as an object enclosed in curly brackets. The server responds back that through 100 OK you created your host. So the host is created inside my session. This is the name I created from a host. If I don't define colors, for example, it's going to use the default values. Once I'm happy with my host, that I created inside my session, I need to publish that change to make it available for all the other administrators. So I do a HTTP post towards the base URL web underscore API slash publish is the API call I'm, I'm sending. And then in the header, I have my content uh, type application JSON. I'm using my session ID as proof. And the payload, I'm sending it formatted in JSON it's just an empty JSON object. It doesn't contain any value name pairs. Then I get the response back from the management server, and it's responding back with something called task ID, because if I do thousands and thousands of changes, it might take some time to do the publish for the management server. And if I'm uh, integrating with third-party systems, I don't want to have a situation where I could have a timeout because the third-party systems send a publish and then are waiting for a response from the server. So in order to avoid that, the server responds directly back in unsynchronous mode saying that, okay, you did the publish, here's the task ID. And the third-party server can then do a show task using the base URL. Content type, application JSON, using the session ID as proof. I can see how far the server has progressed in its tasks. So I get a response back from the server. The task is 10% complete, and then I can send the request again. The task is 20% complete. I can send the request again, and I get, okay, the task is completed, 100% successfully completed. Once I got that information, I can then send my HP post and do a logout because I'm happy with, with the change. I send the header content type application JSON, and then I use my session ID as proof. Inside the payload, I send an object in JSON format without any name and value pairs. And I get the response back from the server. Thank you, you logged out, and everything is fine. Small reminder, our implementation relies only on the post method inside the RESTful API. Even though RESTful APIs by standard support all different types of HP methods, to keep it simple, in the Security Management API, we're only using the POST method. So you're going to be able to play a little bit more with this in the labs later. Whoops! Or what to do when you make a whoopsie? Checking the API status, that's one of the first things you should do if you have a problem. The API parameters can simply be checked by running the API space status command in expert mode on your management server. You get some information if the CPM server is running, if the API server is running, if the FWM services are running, and you get a notification back if the API server should work or not. Now, please remember that by default, the server is only listening to local requests. If you are not able to connect to the management server remotely, it's most probably because after you did a change on the management server and did a publish, you didn't run the API recom command. So try to do that and try to reconnect remotely again. You can also run the API space status command with the deep switches to run additional tests to see if you have some errors when trying to start 
the API server. So if things go sideways when, for example, creating objects using the API calls, the API will give you clear information on actually what was going on. You basically get the same information inside the API as you would get if you were, for example, working with the graphical user interface. So in this case, someone is trying to add the access layers, so a new access layer named Sales and Operations Policy and they want to enable data awareness. But the problem is that this administrator does not have permissions to edit data awareness blades, so it's not allowed to create the sales operations policy because of that. And then the next step in the script would be to add access rules inside the layer sales and operation policy, but since the sales and operation policy does not exist, they're going to get the following error message. Requested object sales and operation policy is not found because in the first step, they were not allowed to create this policy since they were not allowed to edit data awareness blade settings. API gives you clear instructions on what went wrong in the same way as we get with the graphical user interface. If someone is using the API and they have issues and are saying that things are not working as expected, the place to be is the api.elg file. It's your best little friend for monitoring activities associated with API calls. So in this case, someone is trying to do an add access rule to uh, using the API calls and trying to create an, an, an access rule in the layer network. And the name is going to be drop high risk applications. And they want to be at the bottom of the internet access section. We get an error message saying that requested object internet access section is not found. What we can understand from this output when investigating error messages in the API.elg is that the internet access section inside the network layer is not available and therefore this new rule cannot be added in there because there is no internet access section. So the api.elg is your best little friend to troubleshoot why things go sideways when using API calls. In addition to this, if you want to know more and learn more and get code examples, etc. when using the API, I strongly recommend you to go to the Checkpoint community where customers, partners, and experts, and also R&D and, and uh, sales engineers and security experts are asking questions, sharing codes, giving examples on how to use and work with the management server. So you can find the information of the community by going to community.checkpoint.com. Log in there and you're using your user center credentials to log, on, log in to this, this site. And this site contains, for example, a developer network that allows you to find code examples on how to use the API. Some samples written by R&D, some samples written by customers, some samples written by security experts within Checkpoint. Enough talking in this lesson. Let's continue with the lab. In lab one, from the graphical user interface console, you're gonna try to build an API call to add a new host using the CLI commands in the graphical user interface. If you need help, you have the reference guide either online or on your local management server. In step two, lab two, we're gonna use the management underscore CLI executable on your local Windows machine where you have Smart Console installed. And you're going to try to use the management underscore CLI to create a host object of name BigglesWord with the following IP address. And then you're going to create a network object with the following name. And then you're going to use the, the following network and subnet mask. In the second and third lab, we're continuing using the management underscore CLI and we're gonna set the host object's color that we just created. And we're also gonna try to set the network object's color using the set host API call command. You can find more information inside the reference guide on how to do this. So the instructions are not a step-by-step -step guide. You need to try to figure it out yourself. Now, lab two and a half, still management underscore CLI. 
Now we're going to work with the management underscore CLI in batch mode. So we're going to review and edit as needed the CSV file that you have on your Windows machine. The file is called Verticon minus lab.csv or dash lab.csv. So you need to split up the file. So that's a hint. So you need to structure it in the correct way in, a, in order to be able to use the management CLI commands in batch mode. And you need to try to figure out how to do that. In lab three, we're going to use the web API calls. On the Windows machines in the lab environment, there is a web server running locally. So if you open Google Chrome, you will have uh, links pointing you to that web server where you can, for example, do an add host, you can do an edit group, and you can do a show rule base. So try to run those on the local web server towards your management server to see how the communication flow works from the client towards the management server. If you want to see these instructions, they are available on the Google Drive. Remember, this is a lowercase l. Okay, good luck.